A really warm welcome to you. As I said, thank you for joining. One of the key features of today is to give a really warm welcome to a number of new members of the One CGR leadership team, um, namely the four global directors in our institutional strategy and systems division um, that, was, uh, that was announced as announced in July. So in the second half of today's session, we'll invite these colleagues to introduce themselves. Although I should note that um, um, Marion Baraskell is, is, is um, out of the office right now, uh, away, but I'll be, I'll be saying a few words about her role. And we'll be asking them to talk a bit about their role and, and uh, their aspirations and, and the transition. We're also going to invite um, Ali, uh, our regional director for Siwana, and, and Juan Lucas, our global director for partnerships and advocacy for, for updates on a few really important issues. As always, um, we've received lots of questions in advance of this session. Thank you. Um, as we provide our updates, we will endeavor to address as many of these as possible. You will um, again have the option to submit additional um, questions live via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please do that. It makes it far more interactive. I know there are many on the call, but it really helps us feel we're, we're connecting here. Um, and if you wish to ask your question on camera rather than writing, please add the word on camera as you type in your question. We'll then try and bring you in and enable your microphone and camera, uh, trying to accommodate as many of these as possible. Um, during the session, we will again invite you to take a couple of interactive polls. Um, to participate, we will ask you to visit www.menti.com on your computer or phone and enter a code that we will show on the screen. Today's session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the CJR website um, in, the, in the next few days for those that were not able to attend. If you have technical issues, um, please write to events at cjar.org. And so that was quite a few preambular points to make. Anyway, we've made them all now. And why don't we get started with the first poll to get to know our participants a bit better. So what is essential for, hang on, let me turn this. Yeah, what's essential for a healthy and positive working environment? So type the address www.menti.com and the six digit code to enter. And you see the code is on the top left there. 38910490. Trust, fun, absolutely. Teamwork, open communication. Some lots of faded words in the background. Here we go. Accountability, professionalism. Mutual respect. I think I saw the word delegation, but it's moving so fast. Lead by example, empathy, racial equity. Let's give this another 10 seconds. Salary, COVID related health rule, informal chats. There's loads of good stuff there, actually. Respect for true ex experts, ethical behavior. Good. Well, look, thank you so much. There's tons of material here, which is actually um, not going to be um, that we'll be using. Um, we, we won't ignore that because there's, there's, there's loads of useful material that I'm sure Fiona and team and myself and others will be working on as we build our values and, and think about how we work as one CJR. So um, let's move on to the next slide. So the agenda for today. Um, we would like, given the, um, the, the, uh, the events we're seeing in Afghanistan, we wanted to um, give Ali some space to talk about that. I'll say a few words on COVID-19 update. Juan Lucas will talk about the one CGR engagement in the United Nations Food Systems Summit and related events. Uh, I'll say a bit about the, uh, the pulse survey and the leadership response. Claudia will talk about the CGR research initiatives then we will introduce the new global directors, four new, well, three new global directors uh, and, and four, the fourth, which is away, of the Institutional Strategy and Systems Division and then close. So um, 
Um, let us move on to, to that. Um, and, um, and as a reminder, please do signal for the Q&A function on Zoom if you wish to come in and ask your question on camera. So let's turn to Ali, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Elwin, and good morning, everyone. Uh, obviously, we have all been uh, following the uh, unfolding of events in Afghanistan, a very important country for the CG. Uh, and of course, the situation is uh, overall uh, you know, worrying. Uh, CGIR has uh, 39 personnel in the country through operations with uh, mostly Karda and Simit uh, present. Um, ICARDA has 28 long-term consultants. CIMIT has 11 locally recruited consultants. Uh, all staff uh, and their dependents are reported safe. So that's really the good news. And we are really working very hard to try and support them and assist them as much as possible uh, uh, to continue to be uh, safe. It's reported that the foreign troops have uh, completed full withdrawal on August 31st and a de facto government is in place and developing a framework of structure for the uh, operation. So we continue to monitor uh, what's going on and see how best uh, we could both work on the uh, uh, front of supporting our staff, but also uh, what could be potentially the future role of the CG in Afghanistan. So to uh, monitor the situation very closely, we've set up an ad hoc uh, working group uh, comprising of senior staff uh, from ICARDA, uh, CIMIT, HR, directors, uh, center security representatives, relevant, relevant country managers, uh, ICARDA, the DGR, uh, you know, finance and global directors, and of course, the CG global director of people uh, and culture, uh, Fiona, whom you will be introduced to uh, very shortly. The focus of this group, which uh, meets uh, uh, daily since the unfolding of the crisis, is basically four key things. We want to focus on st safety and, uh, of staff and advisory support uh, for their well-being uh, and uh, explore opportunities for financial support, given the extremely challenging conditions on the ground. And of course, exploring and identifying all opportunities for potential relocation assistance, recognizing that this is an individual decision that will have to be made by the individual staff. Experience shows that it's not a simple decision and it's a, a decision that has long-term ramifications and implications. So uh, it's really up to the individual staff to decide how they would wish uh, pro uh, to proceed with the full support from our team in identifying opportunities and all the administrative support that is needed uh, uh, to support them with implementation of whatever the choice they make. Uh, right now, uh, ICARDA and CIMIT offices in Kabul are closed until further notice. We've suspended all field uh, operation also until further notice. There is daily updates between HR department and country managers. Uh, focal points have been identified uh, to be in touch with staff on daily basis, and all personnel have been advised to minimize their movement to essential uh, levels and stay at home uh, uh, in a safe location of their choosing if home is not the right place. So uh, we acknowledge, of course, the amount of stress imposed on personnel, and uh, we continue to work to try and reduce uh, this uh, stress. And I think uh, we've also made free uh, and confidential counseling support made available to staff uh, at their uh, choice. Um, uh, the process of uh, income payments and financial advances has been completed as we promised to help staff, but of course we continue to monitor the cash situation uh, on the ground because that's an essential element of our support uh, to staff. But we continue to look at ways where staff could continue to access uh, funds uh, so that they are able to uh, support themselves uh, the best they can. Uh, in terms of the way forward, uh, as soon as uh, there is a structured government in place based on whatever the Afghani people choose, and uh, it is made clear to the international community, the card and CIMIT, uh, and of course, under one CGIR, will engage with the relevant officials, as may appropriate to emphasize the purpose of our operations in Afghanistan, which is mainly focused on supporting the livelihood and improvement of people through the research uh, we do and the innovations we develop, uh, and to provide more information about the positive development work we've done over the years. I think that's uncontestable. Uh, and the CG has always worked under uh, in many conflict uh, situations. So uh, I think uh, CG overall has some very good experience that we try to deploy 
to deal with those uh, issues. The working group is uh, regularly monitoring the situation and of course, uh, uh, international SOS alerts and media, as well as any other available means to continue to inform ourselves and our staff. So uh, this is uh, uh, basically it. Uh, and uh, we will continue to monitor the situation and update the leadership management board, as well as our staff as and when needed. So back to you, Elwin, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share with our staff where we are on this very critical and important matter. Actually, I'll hand straight to Claudia, who has um, solved the technical glitch. Claudia, over to you. Thank you, Elwin, and uh, apologies. Uh, we are uh, now in Rome and uh, adapting to that, uh, to that new technical system. So sorry I missed you. Um, I really want to extend what I'm sure is all of our uh, gratitude and appreciation for the work that Ali and Bram and Fiona and a large team of people are putting in to do everything that we possibly can for our colleagues in Afghanistan. It is a truly worrying um, uh, moment there. And we, uh, we are trying to work through it as responsibly, as supportively as we can. Well, I think uh, we, we continue to uh, share our thoughts uh, for the people of Afghanistan to, to move through this moment. Um, from, from one area of, of deep concern to another, we also wanted to update on the latest uh, situation regarding COVID and our, and our staff well-being focus with regard to COVID. So let me work back, uh, let me hand back now to Elwin to update where we are with regard to the COVID pandemic. Elwin, please. Thank you, Claudia. <clears throat> Actually, just um, making the link a bit from the work in Afghanistan, I did want to say, you know, I, I've been involved in some of those conversations and there's really good teamwork here. Um, I, I sense that, as do others, that there's a lot we can learn from this situation. Um, and there will be a time for that. And what we're very keen is in the, the new operational structure, there will be a, a global security uh, team which can draw in those lessons and, and, and look at what we've learned from one experience uh, uh, as it might relate to others. Uh, the key lessons around scenario planning, preparedness, um, that I think globally uh, everyone is learning that lesson right now. But And that's really a bridge to the COVID-19. Um, we're doing the same there and, and really trying to help. And, and I really want to recognize the crisis response team, and in, in particular, Jonathan Mackey, who's uh, coordinating that. Um, in, in helping ensure cross-learning between different countries about preparedness. But also, I think that that group is also starting to look at what are the scenarios going forward. There's still only a very small share of the global population that's vaccinated. There are risks of new variants, and you know, we need to be thinking about all the scenarios in our, in our planning for this. And that's one important work, part of that, that team's work. Um, the COVID-19 response team continues to meet weekly uh, to review top um, uh, high-risk countries and, and our general response. Um, one product recently has been um, a set of considerations and recommendations on travel meetings, vaccination and other areas to support a common cross-CGR approach at the country level and in how we organize ourselves. Um, we've got many comments from across CGR that have been incorporated in that. There is now a group of COVID-19 country contact persons. They meet bi-weekly um, to discuss the situation and share knowledge. Um, we continue to have a COVID-19 Centre and Alliance focal point that, that meets, meets monthly. One really important activity is um, vaccine information sessions to encourage informed decision making on the part of staff. That took place in August. We hope that gives greater assurance and, and confidence for people to take a, a put what is a personal decision, but truly hope that, that those vaccinations can be taken because I think it will really protect, protect us collectively. Um, and further sessions are planned on this with additional uh, languages with, with translation. So again, recognition to the team and recognize that there's real variation here. Some parts of the world, people are going about their lives as if they're a little bit back to normal. Um, um, which uh, may not necessarily be the case as we enter the, um, the winter period in the northern hemisphere, but in others, this is still you know real crisis mode as it as it as it ricochets around around the world. So we really appreciate the 
challenges people are facing personally on this as well. Now, back to you, Claudia. Thanks very much, Elwyn. And um, again, just the appreciation for all of the work that's being uh, undertaken across all of CGIR uh, to, to uh, navigate these staff welfare issues in, in the midst of uh, what are really unprecedented moments and on, on many fronts at once. Um, it, it feels a little bit awkward to move directly from these, uh, these issues that are, that are uh, very deeply human and beyond our control. To a, to a large extent to focus on work. Um, but we, we do have also an extraordinary moment this year in, uh, in the context in particular of the UN Food Systems Summit, which is the next topic on our agenda. So uh, without uh, suggesting that the issues of Afghanistan and COVID and, and the hardships that, that staff and our stakeholders are feeling around the world is diminished in any way, uh, let us focus on uh, the work ahead. So I'd like to turn now to Juan Lucas, Juan Lucas Restrepo, to speak to us about one CGR engagement in the Food Systems Summit. Juan Lucas, please. Uh, th thanks a lot, Claudia, and greetings to all uh, colleagues uh, across uh, CGIR. I hope you're all uh, doing well. And yes, this, this is not uh, such a you know, negative and, and difficult uh, process. Uh, in terms of its human dimension, but still very challenging, very fluid, very political, and absolutely critical to our mandate. So I will take the next five minutes uh, to try to synthesize uh, where we are uh, in terms of the summit, how CGIR has engaged, but especially uh, towards the end, what role we do we foresee uh, for CGIR as we implement uh, as, as this uh, process is implemented uh, and, and supports meeting the 2030 SDGs. So next one, please. So basically, as, as you basically all know, uh, this has been a people's summit. Uh, there's been uh, already more than 100,000 people that have directly participated in providing uh, ideas, participating in different dialogues, uh, di different venues. And, and what this process uh, did was over time to uh, bring together more than 2,200 uh, 2, uh, solutions, ideas to transform the, the, the food system summit into, coali into clusters, into uh, coalitions of, of actions that are bringing together the interests uh, and hopes of many stakeholders uh, and now uh, bringing also uh, countries, uh, governments uh, around those ideas on, and those coalitions to move forward this uh, very important uh, objective of transforming the food systems uh, for, for people, planet uh, and, and nature. Uh, and as CGIR, and even though we, we are in, in transitioning uh, ourselves, uh, we've been quite successful in embedding our work, uh, our staff, our uh, scientists across the different uh, solution clusters, the science group, the policy papers, the global and the local uh, food systems dialogues, the champions group, uh, etc. And uh, the, the UN FSS secretariat uh, keeps uh, working very closely with us. So we are seen as an important uh, partner across the different elements uh, of, of the summit. And lately, we, are, uh, we have even been able to contribute and provide inputs to what will be a very important uh, statement uh, from the Secretary General uh, on the date of the summit, on the 23rd of September, that will basically lay out uh, what uh, will be uh, the implementation uh, of all of these uh, commitments and all of these uh, ideas that have been brought together during the past almost two years. Next one, please. So basically, uh, we had about three weeks ago, almost a month ago, a, a, a pre-summit uh, in Rome. We had a strong physical presence uh, here as well as, as online. We uh, led sessions, we participated uh, uh, in, in affiliated uh, sessions, and we were able around the summit to start presenting 
our uh, CGIR prospectus and showcasing our work as a one CGIR. So it was a very good test and with a, a very good uh, reception and, 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 and response on having a one CGIR present as a whole, the whole system uh, uh, in this uh, pre-summit. Next one, please. So what's happening at the moment, and, and this is a still a draft and very fluid, it's being a, a consulted with a governments because now governments a, that will meet in the General a, Assembly will agree on the way forward a, for, the, for, the, for the summit. But this is basically a, how the summit a, as it stands a, will be implemented. So uh, the Secretary General will bring everything together, planet, people, prosperity, on a statement of action uh, around these three areas of convergence. And the ways things will be organized is that the main efforts will be nationally led, led by governments and member states uh, on the 23rd and, and later, will start working on their commitments, their pathways, their strategies, for food systems transformation, relying uh, and, and taking into account their local contexts, but of course also drawing from all of the global and regional efforts uh, uh, that are and, and solutions that will be brought forward by uh, the different uh, coalitions uh, that I will mention in, in a few minutes. Uh, the same will happen at the regional level, the regional groups, the regional economic bodies, political bodies will also be tasked into understanding uh, and, and supporting pathways at the, at the regional level. So we see a lot of opportunity for our regional structure uh, to embed very clearly and help CGIR be part of those, uh, of those pathways. And then the, the Secretariat is deciding, and this is still a little bit fluid, on five action areas that will bring together all the initiatives and constituents uh, uh, around uh, these, these coalitions. And these five areas are about nourishing all people, boosting nature positive production, advancing equitable livelihoods. It's about resilience to vulnerability, shocks, and stresses, and a cross-cutting one on means of implementation, where we have all the finance governance, uh, science policy interface, uh, human rights, uh, Etc. So if we move to the next one, uh, and, and this should be uh, exciting uh, for all of us, this is currently what the Secretariat is presenting as coalitions uh, or emerging uh, uh, initiatives uh, under the summit. And if you look at the different, uh, the different uh, titles uh, there, we see healthy diets, we see blue and aquatic foods, we see agroecology, uh, we see uh, sustainable livestock, a lot of what CGIR does and is part of our 2030 agenda. So we have a very important job of making sure that we keep engaged in those uh, emerging coalitions, that as they bring the interest uh, of, of governments, they will be part of the implementation of the summit uh, going forward. Next one, please. And my last one is basically, uh, what we are seeing and interpreting should be the next steps and how CGIR should, uh, how we should organize at CGIR. So as I mentioned, we need to be through our country offices and, 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 and with the support of our regional directors, uh, embedding ourselves in the work of governments, the, the pressure they will get to commit to plan for system transformation food system transformation uh, pathways. And at the global level, with the EMT, with part, the partnerships team, with the science areas, we need to make sure we engage in a, in a productive and effective way in those coalitions that are of most interest to us, where we have a, a scientific technical capacities that we can contribute that are well aligned with our a 2030 strategy. And the last thing we need to do is to make sure we embed ourselves well in the implementation mechanisms or of the UNFSS that are still being negotiated. They're, they're not set yet, but there is discussions on whether these will need a small technical unit as secretariat, uh, what the role of UN bodies, wrong-based agencies, 
etc. will be. And as that becomes more clear in the coming days uh, going into the summit, we would need to make sure uh, CGIR offers uh, and you know, we make sure our capacities are well accounted for so we can also support the implementation across the board uh, of the summit. The last thing is that we've also been quite successful in terms of comms uh, and events. So we already have a, a pretty much assured some speaking slots at, at the summit uh, event on September 22nd. So CGIR presence will again be there as, as we uh, were successful in the, in the pre-summit. And we are accompanying all of these with global opeds uh, uh, that are you know, replicated at the regional and national level with uh, thought leadership pieces, uh, et cetera. So uh, we are doing well in a, in a fluid, uh, uncertain still uh, a process in, in, in many ways, but, but making sure CGIR doesn't lose on this amazing opportunity that leverages our capacities to uh, implement uh, and, and execute uh, and excel in our own 2030 strategy. Over to you, Claudia. Or over to you, Edwin. Yes, I, <clears throat> Claudia, I can't hear you, um, but it's me next anyway. Um, so let me talk about the, um, the pull survey and, and, and leadership response. But actually, there was a question that came up from uh, in the chat from, uh, yeah, from, from a colleague about should centers um, not be recommending that staff are vaccinated? Um, this is a sensitive issue, as we all know. Um, the, the guidance that, that was circulated from the uh, COVID uh, crisis response team um, did did talk about that and 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 it, it basically was recommending that all centers continue to encourage vaccination when vaccines are available as the simplest and most effective and safest way to support staff well, welfare in this crisis um, and noting that vaccine hesitancy um, remains a significant concern <clears throat> hence the information sessions that have been organized because many staff may have questions um, also, you know, CGR is not currently um, recommending that centers um, require staff to be vaccinated as a formal requirement for return to work and travel. Um, um, but, but however, th th this will be managed at a, an individual country level and center for the present, but that, that situation is still evolving. So we're not at the, at the current time, not suggesting this is a formal requirement per se, but our strongly encouraging um, staff to, to, to inform themselves and to, to go ahead and, and get the vaccination. Um, but again, it's still a personal decision, obviously, which has impacts on, on colleagues as well and, and collectively. Um, so thank you for asking that question. Please keep this, these questions coming. I am now to talk about the pull survey. Um, um, I wanna thank you for responding to the first all CGIR pull survey. Um, and it's a quarterly survey, so there'll be another one coming. And we got a great response rate. I mean, we had <clears throat> 3,700 colleagues provided feedback, and that's, that's almost half of the, the workforce, which we think is a really good start. We hope there'll be more next time, um, but thank you for that. Um, and I'm really grateful for the leadership across the CGIR that um, really encouraged staff to fill out this survey and to the people and culture community for encouraging colleagues to respond. So key strengths and areas for improvement. Um, on key strengths, 80, uh, a very high number of staff um, recommend CGR as a place to work, feel their contribution is valued, feel they're provided with the support tools they need to do their jobs, feel they're uh, kept informed about the transition, um, feel CGR has a positive future. I really like that response there. Um, and believe that one CGR will make the work of CGR and its entities more impactful. That's also really encouraging. Um, as always, there are areas for improvement, and, and this is really helpful to us because I'm sure there are many things we can and, and will be doing better. Um, key here was um, colleagues uh, feeling that uh, ideas, a number of colleagues feel their ideas and opinions are, on, um, are not being listened to. Um, there are concerns about job security, 
there is concerns about whether communications are, cl are clear and easy to understand um, and uh, desire to find more opportunities to feedback on the transition. <clears throat> so um, we uh, um, let, let me say a few words about, about those, particularly those areas for improvement, because I actually agree with that we need to strengthen on all of these areas. Um, so we, we did share some initial thoughts on that in the note we sent around um, recently to give to share this feedback. Um, on this point about um, jobs and job security, um, look, here we really want to make sure we move ahead swiftly um, with the next phases of the transition, because I feel, we feel that will give people a much clearer sense of security about their continuing role in CJR and their role in the, in the one CJR um, or operational structure. So that includes um, the initial individual affiliations of staff by the end of September. So staff will all know which of the 10 groups or six regions they are affiliated to that they will be part of. Launching the next phase of senior appointments. Uh, we want to get that started um, at the, uh, in, in, in September this month, <clears throat> because we've now um, really on the point of announcing the last few remaining global and regional director positions. There was a bit of hiring in global uh, in, uh, engagement and innovation, but that's, that's nearly done. So we've, we've largely completed that hiring process. And, and now it's the remaining senior directors. We also want to give um, identify the director level positions as well, um, so that staff can have a good feel about where they might express their levels of interest um, to go for those roles. Um, and of course, we'll continue to give priority to the excellent internal talent. So these will be internal only processes for now. Um, uh, only if we do not have sufficient applications based on certain criteria would we, would we consider going, uh, in, in going externally. Um, and lastly, by the end of 2021, we want to, we want to gradually shift reporting lines um, to build the new integrated teams of the operational structure. But we want, we want to do that in a way that uh, will not disrupt ongoing project delivery. And actually, as you said before, many, many colleagues, um, except for the more senior ones, are actually going to, uh, their working environment will change a lot. But actually, they will probably continue with the same line manager and they will probably continue in their in their broad area of work. They might just be serving um, a broader constituency, for example, someone with a certain expertise in IT, rather than providing that expertise to one centre might be providing it um, across CJR. Um, so again, I want to emphasize, it's totally understandable that there will be a lot of feelings of job insecurity in a change this big. But this is not at all driven by um, uh, a cost cutting as our primary objective. Obviously, we want to be more efficient, but it's not a cost cutting or downsizing ex exercise. We want to actually increase our funding and, and be able to grow and do that in an efficient and effective uh, way. We want to actually increase the effectiveness of the services we provide. On feedback and listening, um, following the, the, there's a key point in the management transition here. Um, Following the, the affiliations and then the, uh, the coming on stream of these global regional directors and then the senior directors, they will be tasked with very quickly starting a number of discussions with all those staff that are part of that, that group. So we can expect regular town hall discussions with glo within global and regional groups to complement our bi-monthly bi all staff webinars. Um, and that will create far more spaces for the leadership, the new leadership to engage with you as, as staff, that in a way that it's, it's been quite hard with EMT um, without those senior directors and global regional directors in place to do that as much as we, we would like with you. So expect a lot more engagement, including an initial discussion coming up very soon to talk about and, and the new structure within each group and to really look at the work that's been done and, and validate that and, and, and engage staff in, in how we're moving forward on that. Um, we're also looking at the, some of the architecture around how we include staff in the, in the transition process. Um, and on communications, um, we're actually strengthening capacity on this. Um, and we have a, we're working with the change management task team 
to, to look at how we, we make our more accessible products. We appreciate that there's just a lot of information. It's a complex change process. We can find ways to do this better. Um, we are, last point here, we are looking at ways to further analyze the results of this survey um, according to lots of different criteria. Um, and and that, will be, that will be something that we will share in a more detailed, with a more detailed breakdown of the results. Um, Jeff Leroy asked about this. Um, so we will be sharing that pretty soon um, because it's actually the granularity of these surveys that are often really interesting where there are differences between certain stakeholder groups. Um, we are, so we're actually going through that process now and, and, and discussing it with the change management task team. There was another question about when will the next pulse survey be uh, carried out? Um, we aim to do, it's quarterly, so we aim to do another one when we are through with the affili initial affiliations exercise. So expect another one um, probably about the middle of next month. Um, and again, I'd strongly encourage you to fill this out again. It's incredibly useful to us and to encourage your, your colleagues to, to do so. Um, please, back to you with that, Claudia. If Claudia is, oh yes, you are, yes. I'm not, I haven't won the battle with my technology and I know that I'm echoing quite a lot right now. So I'll keep my speaking to a minimum. Um, I'm not sure if there are additional questions that we have. I, uh, Elwin, I see that you've answered a couple of the questions that had come in earlier. Um, I don't know if there's, if there are questions in the chat or Fiona, if there's anything that you would like to add. I don't see any more questions. I am Fiona, feel free to add them. No, thank you. I, I think we've covered most of it. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, then we're right on time and we will move directly then into uh, a brief update on the initiatives. Um, and I'll jump right in here on that. And let me say, that, uh, well, first of all, let me say how pleased um, I was with the participation that we had in the poll survey. So let me add my thanks to Elwin uh, for all of the engagement that, uh, that we have had. And uh, it's just terrifically important that we hear from you so that we can continue to work in a way that, uh, that really focuses on the issues that matter most. So thank you so much for all of that. Claudia, could I, could I come in? There's a question just to make this interactive. I, I saw a question, uh, a question just came up. Um, it was uh, the science area global directors were appointed many months ago. No appointments have been made to date to the next level of leadership uh, positions. When do we expect that to happen? Um, great question. Um, Fiona, why don't you, you're now leading this process with myself and colleagues. Please, could you say something about that? And if your mic isn't working, I can't hear you, Fiona. I can a, a, also... Apologies. I think Claudia and I are stuck uh, with some technical challenges today. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes. Okay, fantastic. It's a really good question, and I'm glad that it's been asked. Um, we have two, and, and I was, I was going to come on to this later in the webinar, but what we have two really exciting things happening in the coming weeks and months. Uh, now that we have all our, uh, the majority of our global directors in place, uh, we have the opportunity to do something that we're calling a structural validation, which is a very fancy way of saying that we're taking a look at the organigram that we have and making sure that it's fit for purpose, making sure it's really going to get us where we need to go in terms of achieving our vision and our mission. Um, and that's going to happen very quickly in the next few weeks. And once that's over, then that organogram will then allow us to create very clear job descriptions for the next two, uh, next couple of levels of positions and actually get moving uh, with the advertisements. So what we're hoping is that um, we will be able to move swiftly and transparently and fairly to get the next couple of levels uh, of positions filled and, and get moving on uh, filling those important roles thank you and if i can add there's another question can announcement announcements of new positions uh, be i think it mean be circulated among the staff in 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 the email system um yes um we will communicate um very openly and transparently the new positions so that all staff can see um uh, when they are you know how how to apply 
and how to put themselves forward. Right, Fiona, I know this is something that you're, you're really concerned that this is a transparent process. Remember, we are talking here just about the really senior positions, the remaining senior directors and, and the directors. We're not talking about all the other positions where actually, you know, we are not anticipating some mass, everyone having to apply for their jobs. I think most jobs will essentially be translated into a different reporting line and we will not need to go through a competitive process of any kind for that. We're talking about the leadership positions where we felt it was important, given that in many cases, um, there might be a number of st internal staff that feel they, they should be able to apply for those positions that we felt we needed this process. Fiona, did you want to add anything on that? No, I think you've captured it very well. Uh, we've spent um, the past couple of weeks thinking very carefully and very consciously around how to make sure that everything that we're doing for the next couple of levels are, are, is totally transparent. Um, so we're working with our digital services colleagues to find the best possible way uh, of, of uh, announcing in a very timely manner all of the job descriptions, all of the vacancies as they become available for those next couple of levels of leadership positions that will be filled competitively. So everybody who, who has an internet connection and a CGI or a email address should be able to access it quickly and hopefully express interest in, in a a very simplified process because our goal is to reduce bureaucracy um, and uh, and move things quickly. Thank you. Thanks back to you, Claudia. Thank you. Great. Thank you, then. Um, and we're looking forward just after this update on the initiative to introduce you to the most recent appointments to that leadership team as well. But uh, let me take a few minutes to update everybody on where we stand with regard to the new CGR initiative. Um, and we've been making, I think, excellent progress uh, across all of the science group or action areas, the systems transformation, uh, resilient aggregate systems, genetic innovations, and the regional initiatives. We're creating what I believe is a truly uh, innovative and quite interesting portfolio in each one of these areas, covering a range of topics that both build on our work, but also really push beyond and leverage the opportunity of one CGIR for the breadth and capacity that we have and uh, for, for us to enable a more systems approach in the development of some of these initiatives. Um, in addition to the initiatives themselves, we are developing what is being called a companion document that has been requested by our funder partners, which will highlight how this set of initiatives creates a coherent whole. So this paper will uh, explain how the set of initiatives really cover all of the critical areas where CGIR needs to make a difference by 2030 um, and how that set of initiatives becomes greater than the sum of its parts, how it can be operationalized as a true portfolio. So that's another interesting uh, aspect of the initiative development that's going on right now. But the initiatives themselves, they are on track to be delivered for launch in January smoothly. We have 33 initiatives that will be submitted as we know first to the ISBC and then to the Council for Funding. The expectation is that about 20 of these will be submitted at the end of September with all of the remaining submitted at the end of November in uh, essentially what will be effectively a rolling process. And that puts us very much in the final stretch right now. Of course, some of the initiatives are more advanced than others in their preparation. Um, and for example, the regional integrated initiatives, which are one of the newer elements of the portfolio, those initiatives are still very much in the process of organizing stakeholder meetings in all of the regions. And we really appreciate that. These regional integrated initiatives give us an opportunity to really engage with our stakeholders and to focus our place-based impacts so these meetings uh, to speak with stakeholders are really quite essential. Um, the regional integrated initiatives, of course, are also working with the global initiatives to ensure that there's synergy. And we expect a lot of leverage between the regional and global initiatives in a way that we can, for example, apply the insights and developments of our global work into our regional projects. And then also in this feedback, and feedback on demand and the insights through implementation that we have through our regional projects, we can feed that back into global work that needs to be done. 
So the development of the portfolio as a whole is one that provides, I think, a lot of opportunity for learning and synergy and ambition. Um, uh, let me extend in particular a note of appreciation for our IDTs, our initiative development teams. They are making a tremendous effort and doing really excellent work. They are working um, in, an, in a very challenging timeframe and they're working with teams from across CGIR and with key outside partners. And they are really, they're really working our way forward as one CGIR in real time. And I, I just have to appreciate uh, enormously the work that those teams are doing and uh, the leadership of the science group directors in, uh, in managing these, uh, these sets of initiatives. We know as the research initiatives are being finalized that the question of funding is very top of mind at the moment. And on this, let me just say that we continue to see a very strong commitment um, and very strong engagement from our funder partners and have every reason to expect a quite smooth transition into the new portfolio. Uh, both the EMT and the science group directors have met regularly with the system council and with key funders to keep them updated, uh, to ensure that there are no surprises or disruptions between now and the end of the year, and we will be meeting and updating them again next week. So this is uh, very much an ongoing process and one that to date anyway is going uh, very smoothly, uh, thanks to the effort that so many of you are making in delivering this uh, portfolio. In the interest of time, let me jump right into a couple of the questions that were submitted ahead of time on the initiatives. We had a question from Guy Holo, or maybe it's Guy Holo, I apologize, from SIP, asking what is the budget for, uh, what is the process for budgeting the new initiatives? And so let me give a little bit more detail. Um, a budget team has been put together to provide a standard template and guidance for all of the initiative design teams and each of the initiatives we'll need to develop an upper and lower range budget for the 2022 to 24 period. The science group directors will provide each of the teams with the envelopes uh, to guide their budgeting. And the science group directors are now working quite closely together, um, initiative by initiative to look at these envelopes to make sure that the distribution of pooled funding aligns with CGIR's strengths and priorities and with an eye to, uh, to the smooth transition into our new portfolio. So excellent question, Guy, thank you. A Wellington Akaya from ILRI asked, what is the plan for capacity development and the other two impact pathways uh, now that the initiatives are advancing? It's a great question. So the initiatives are planning capacity development in two ways. Firstly, as Wellington has already identified, capacity development is one of the three strands in the bundle of pathways to impact that were included in the research and innovation strategy alongside policy engagement and technologies. So all of the initiative design teams are making plans and allocating resources for effective capacity development to achieve the likelihood breadth and depth of impact that we want to see from our research. In addition, the second pathway is that the initiative design teams are being asked to identify specific capacity development opportunities for early career research staff within the CGIR and potentially for student placements as well. Um, of course, this is an ongoing discussion, so uh, ideas for capacity development, which is clearly a priority, um, are welcome uh, with the IDTs and the science group directors. A third question that we received ahead of time was uh, from Adam Hunt of CIMIT, former Lumi. What does the initiative framework mean for the platforms in the new structure? So that's a, a great question, Adam. And among the current platforms, only one, the gender platform will remain as a platform in its current format. The other three, which are excellence in breeding, Gene banks and big data will all be transitioned into initiatives. An additional set of platforms will be launched for the other impact areas on nutrition, poverty reduction, environment, and climate. What's important here is that the key difference between an initiative and a platform in the new model is that initiatives do research and deliver results. 
While platforms don't do research, they engage with the research that's ongoing in initiatives. The platforms instead seek to enhance the impact from CGIR portfolio by convening communities of practice, by raising capacity, by advising management and by advising or amplifying our intern, our, sorry, our external voice and advocacy efforts. So the platforms will work with um, initiatives that are undertaking research, but the platforms themselves won't be delivering research. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a shift, uh, a bit of something new to get our minds around as we move into the new structure. Um, I have not been following online any questions that may have come in on the initiatives. Uh, I'm hoping that perhaps my colleagues, uh, the science group directors have. Maybe I could open now if there are any questions in the question and answer that the science group directors would specifically like to speak to in our remaining three minutes for this item. Uh, Martin? Barbara or uh, Yo, if you're online, are there any questions that you would like to pick up? It seems that we are good apparently on, on questions and answers. Um, so if, if no one else uh, would like to jump in, then we could move directly to our next item, um, which is uh, to introduce our new global directors. And I will look back through the questions and answers online and try to answer online anything that we haven't uh, live at the moment. So let me move then uh, back to Elwyn to introduce our new global directors. Elwyn, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a slide for this. Okay. Um, but first, let me say, um, a few words about the Institutional Strategy and Systems Division. So I need to turn that, whenever a message comes up, it beeps. Sorry, I need to change that next call. Um, look, um, you may recall that there are three divisions in the one in the new CGIR that will, in which, into which all staff will be part. Um, there is the one on global engagement innovation. There's, of course, the research um, and uh, division. And there's institutional strategy and systems division, which is all the services and, and the operational, uh, a lot of the operational um, work around finance, people, IT, um, governance um, uh, it will, be, will be managed uh, for the whole CGIR. So, um, of course, we know the CGR mission to deliver science innovation that advance the transformation of food, land and water systems in a climate crisis. We all know we can't do that and we can't do good science if we don't have really excellent um, corporate services of one form or other that are the best available. And we believe that um, by working together and having the economies of scale of being one CGR, um, rather than doing this necessarily uh, individually as, uh, as one center in the past, we can actually have better services, better value, um, and, and be able to, to, be, to be really best in class. So obviously um, the ISNS uh, division you know, will, be, will be driven by serving our partners, which are, of course, the science groups, the global engagement innovation, which are our colleagues across the system. Um, we will build diverse and inclusive teams to make sure that, like, like none of us want these divisions to become silos unto themselves or even groups. So we're going to have to work really closely with colleagues and continue, in most cases, sitting alongside them in, in different parts of the world, um, combining skill sets and bringing people together to make sure we, we deliver these, these, these high quality services. Um, as I said, there's just, I just sense when I'm on calls with, I don't know, for the first time, I think we had a call of all the HR colleagues across CJR. Um, the, there was just a lot of excitement about what we can do. Obviously there was anxiety about going through this change and, and uh, I, I continue to assure colleagues that this is about taking the skills we've got and the people we've got and helping them serve the whole of CJR in this new structure. It's taking the leadership we've got and staff we've got and deploying them into this, this new structure. But there was a lot of excitement about the opportunities and the same certainly applies on financial management. The same applies on, for example, security. 
um, the same certainly applies on IT and, and, and within that certainly um, IT sec uh, digital security um, uh, for our HR management I mentioned and the way we organize our various boards needs to be brought, brought together so um, loads of opportunities we aim to um, uh, have in a sense an early stage operating model ready by the end of this year so we can go live with the science groups and the operational structure um, uh, for next year. But that's an early stage model and many of the services um, and, and systems that we'll be delivering will take more time to actually finalize. So in many cases, we'll see next year as continuing to use and benefit from the various center based services such as procurement and payroll. It's just that'll be on behalf of the new operational structure and those staff will be reporting into that, that, that operational structure. So a brief intro, um, I think we can take that slide down now, colleagues. Um, right, um, now let's introduce the new global directors. Um, uh, going in alphabetical order, let me turn to the three of the four that are here today to introduce themselves, and then I'll say a few words about um, Marion's current task that she's working on. So let's start first with um, Fiona. Um, Bordan Farrell as Global Director of People and Culture. Fiona, if you could just say a little bit about your, your experience background, um, what excites you about the, 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 the future in this role, and maybe just a few words on actually what you're working on this week would be helpful. Over to yes. you. Thank you so much. Morning, good, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. As Elwyn said, my name is Fiona Farrell, and I'm now in my fourth week as one CGR's Global Director for People and Culture. Uh, many of you may know me from my most recent role as Senior Advisor for Gender Diversity and Inclusion, or, or GDI for short, or you might know me from my time as HR Director for ERI or as HR Director for ICRASAT. In total, I've spent over eight years in CGIR out of an over 25 year career that, that's taken me uh, from working in the private sector with companies such as McKinsey and Sodexo through to eight years with the UN in the field as well in New York, uh, as well as roles with, with Irish Ada and others. So now as your new global director uh, of people and culture, I feel very fortunate to have this amazing opportunity to work alongside you all in an extremely exciting and transformative time for our organization. Um, Elwyn asked me what excites me about the role. Well, I believe that one CGIR is the right construct for our future. And I'm thrilled that the people and culture group are going to play a really important part in helping to deliver that construct. Um, I believe that if, if we seize this opportunity, if we get one CGIR right, we will be even more collaborative, more efficient and, and more effective. We'll be an even better place to work and we will be even better able to deliver on our mission. And that mission is very important to me personally, as I know it is to you. It's what made me join CGIR in the first place. So in the people and culture group, uh, these coming weeks and months, uh, we'll see us heavily focused on supporting the exercise we referred to earlier on in the webinar. Uh, you'll see us uh, working to support the finalization of the organization structure and get the positions filled. Uh, we want to move, as we mentioned earlier, swiftly, transparently, and, and really fairly through processes that will see those remaining senior roles competitively filled and then following the completion of the alignment and the affiliation exercise, um, we want to see the efficient mapping of staff to the new structure. Now, Elwyn touched on, on this earlier, but in a time of change, it's only normal for us to worry about what all this change is going to mean for us. Um, it's only human to be concerned about our jobs and our careers fully understand this and I share your desire to complete this process as quickly and fairly as possible. So I look forward um, to taking you through the details of exactly how that will happen in a series of upcoming communications. Um, for the rest of 2021 and beyond, um, the new people and culture function will work step by step through all of the important HR elements, including our policies, our processes and systems, how we recruit and support career development, how we recognize and reward achievement, 
our compensation and benefit structures, including the taxation issue that was raised in the chat. And, and thinking through how we can together build an inclusive, fair and safe global workplace and culture. Um, the chair is a common set of values, but continues to respect the local context. It's, it's a long list and we have a lot to do. Um, in response to, to some of the questions raised in the chat, it is going to be very important for us as a people and culture function to think very carefully through our own group structure and make sure that we're organized in a way that allows our great staff with their skills and their institutional memory and their understanding of the great things that are working well on the ground to, to get ourselves in a place where we can deliver all those strategic advisory and standard high quality admin services that are needed for one CGIR. And we'll do this together in a very collaborative way in the coming months. So while I'm very excited about all these opportunities, I am conscious of the need to prioritize and balance that need for speed uh, with making changes mindfully, because we want to get them right first time. Uh, some of the PNC changes will be multi-year projects, uh, where in other years we might find it, uh, we're able to move more quickly to common ways of working. And uh, we will um, find multiple ways of keeping you up to date on those changes. So to wrap up, um, it's a real honor and a privilege to be in the role. And I look forward to sharing more in upcoming webinars and town halls. Thank you very much in advance for working with your great people and culture colleagues as we make the transition together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Fiona, and congratulations, which I should have said to all of you at the start. Um, there were, I should have also said there was a fantastic number of really high quality people that went for these roles. Um, and, and so, you know, it was, uh, it was a testament to the quality of people we have um, and also your, your skills in, in being, being the one selected. Um, on the same basis, um, let me introduce other colleagues. Um, uh, Carmen Bennett as Global Director of Governance and Assurance. Thanks, Owen. Uh, hi, colleagues. Fantastic to be on the call today with you. Um, from the slide that Owen put up, governance and assurance is all about um, how our boards are managed, how our legal teams and services are delivered, how risk management is led and stewarded across the global uh, landscape, and how we do ethics and business conduct, which we've seen in a number of the chats. Um, Ama, uh, you mentioned um, how we're going to standardize our processes and one of the things that uh, governance and assurance will help us do is build a, a one CGR policy framework so that we are doing things the same instead of multiple different ways and multiple different channels. We'll also make sure that um, we take care of the local situation. So we might have global policies that are the formal rules across the globe but then we'll also be sure that we understand what local context so we can do the famous think globally, act locally. Um, I'm excited to be in this role as is Fiona. She really expressed the privilege that it is to be part of the global uh, leadership team. I come to this role having uh, served uh, with the system organization for the last six years and, and worked in integrating our uh, governance framework as we move towards one CGR. Um, I'm a qualified lawyer in my, in my, in my past life and have spent years um, focused on um, sustainable development goals and issues across, uh, across um, development and, and um, human health uh, issues. Um, Erwin asked us, uh, what are some of our immediate priorities? Because that, that seems like a long a journey ahead. So uh, we are excited that the staff affiliation exercise is coming to a close so that as Fiona mentioned, we can start to look at the proposed um, institutional structure within governance and assurance specifically, and validate that by working um, collaboratively with colleagues who are affiliated into that groups, and then get on and make sure that we can um, work as a, as a global team, um, building on the footprint of the existing legal entities, because one CGR is not in the chat, um, a new legal structure. Actually, it's an operational structure that sits right across the wonderful footprint that we have across the globe, sitting behind me on the camera there. Um, and so we're going to sit on each of the legal entities, respect all of the fantastic host country agreements and uh, take us forward. So 
I do want to leave time for, for others to come in. So uh, back to you, Elwin, but again, just to reiterate how exciting it is to be in this role for the next year or so to be helping to steward such fantastic colleagues and uh, really looking forward to, to getting to know everyone and working extremely closely with you. Thanks, Carmen, and, and, and like Fiona, also for your continued efforts to get help us get where we've got to already. Um, so let me also introduce um, Hulud Odep, um, who is the Global Director of Digital Services, or I should say will be from September the 13th. Uh, Hulud has kindly agreed to join us before she starts, just to say a few words. So I don't expect you to say anything about what you're doing this week um, with respect to one CGR, apart from participating in this call, uh, but really look forward to you joining. Um, so over to you, Hulu. Uh, thank you, Elwin, and uh, thank you everyone for the warm welcome I have received uh, since the announcement, even before I, I join uh, formally. Uh, my name is Khulud Ode, and uh, a little bit about myself. I was born in uh, Palestine to a science teacher and a lawyer. I'm the youngest in seven, uh, one boy and six girls. Uh, my mother mainly raised me as my father died when I was five. So I grew up in a woman's uh, powerhouse. Uh, in terms of career, I spent more than 20 some years in, in the tech field, uh, but I have two main chapters in my career. The first one started in the private sector uh, where I was uh, a technologist at heart as a programmer and consultant. Uh, but the second one uh, was in international development and nonprofit and policy research sector where I became a technologist with a heart um, and led multiple digital transformations uh, for impact initiatives. Uh, for me, joining CGR at the, this juncture and taking part in making uh, the digital technology central to CGIRs way of working is, is a once in a lifetime experience uh, an opportunity to join a, a global organization like yours uh, racing against a tight uh, timeline to figure a sustainable path forward uh, for our future generations and find solutions to the most pressing challenges uh, facing us. Uh, I'm an optimist in general. So when I think of opportunities, uh, I see tremendous ones. Uh, here for harnessing the power of digital technology and data um, in many ways to gain efficiencies and, and build resilient uh, technology infrastructure, reduce security risks, as uh, you heard. Uh, but most importantly, I think to work and collaborate in, in smarter ways, uh, improve staff digital work experience around the globe, especially working in an environment under the pandemic. Uh, measure and communicate results in digitally and visually appealing formats, uh, breaking data silos to gain better insights and make data-driven decisions, remove technology infrastructure uh, barriers uh, that are in the way of researchers to unlock uh, the power of data and advanced uh, uh, computing technologies such as cloud or AI and, and big data and others. Uh, but most importantly is to accelerate uh, the delivery of the desired impact uh, articulated in the one CJR 2030 strategy that I uh, got the chance to review parts of it uh, in depth. Um, and of course, there will be challenges. Uh, uh, one CJR is, is such a large and complex intake, and I know that the path uh, to its success is going to be full of unknowns um, that hopefully we will uncover and learn as we proceed together. Um, there will be challenges on technical process, data, uh, user experience levels, uh, but still I believe an organization with thousands of staff across the world uh, that chose to tackle some of the most complex challenges in the world, uh, such as hunger and poverty and gender equalities uh, and climate, um, I think is ready and capable of handling uh, as one team the pains uh, of change associated with uh, whether it's digital transformation or other uh, systems transformations that uh, are taking place. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be joining you in about 10 days, uh, and I look forward to working with the, my amazing peers and, and leaders um, and all of you. Uh, and to the IT leaders and IT teams across CGIR, I really look forward to meeting and working with each of you soon. Uh, I'm so excited and can't wait to see what we will accomplish together as global digital services team. Thank you, Elwin. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, and, and congratulations. Um, the um, the fourth position um, was the global director of business operations and finance. Um, delighted that Marianne Bariskel 
um, was successful. Um, she's out of office, so can't join us today. Um, but I think many of you will know Marion. Uh, she's director, was director of um, finance uh, at World Fish. Um, um, has 20 years of experience in progressively um, senior positions. Um, a uh, number of those years were, were at senior leadership levels in KPMG, as well as the British Council. And she's a member of the board of Transparency International. She um, uh, um, is working uh, very intensively on some key startup issues around that role, including um, looking at what's the, uh, validating the operational structure that had been worked up in the design uh, working groups and very other pro various other um, groups to um, for the for the operations and finance division. Um, she's also work, working intensively on um, on financial uh, financing modalities, um, how we arrange our financial systems uh, around the new one CGIR operating model, including how we work with funders, how they provide finance. And she's also with colleagues working on how we prepare the budget um, for the operational structure um, for next year. Um, and a fin plan around that budget um, with uh, increasing work going on how we would manage that budget and putting putting together guidelines on budget management in the new operational structure so she has a lot on her plate as do um, all her colleagues in ISS and across the leadership team so there were some questions that we received um, Claudia shall I just launch into those uh, or did you want to highlight any for me I think we can please just go straight right into them thanks OK, um, there was a question um, I saw on the chat about what's the next stage of consultation around the operational structure. Um, I think what that question is about is we have some broad designs um, for each group that were prepared some months ago. And what we now need to and, and how are we going to consult on really how we realize that? Um, not just the transition, but the destination. I think that's an excellent question. It's exactly what we need, the new global and regional directors, and then their senior directors to do incrementally as we get to levels and levels of, 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 of granularity at each level of the new structure. So expect to be um, um, involved in quite rapid discussions now to just um, um verify the pro the, the the broad structure for each group so we can actually with confidence advertise the senior um director and director level positions um and and then within each of the then units in each group expect more dis discussions with the senior director and director positions as we as we cascade levels of detail so the great thing is with the leadership positions increasingly in place and expands our bandwidth and ability to engage more and more staff in this transition, which we want to maximize that. It's any number of change management books that say the way to engage hearts and minds is to engage colleagues in the, in the design of what we're moving into. And we certainly believe that. Um, there was a question um, about when we will see, or I'll bring in some of my colleagues in a moment, but I should answer this because, because Kundavi is, is not able to join the call. She's also out of office. So there was a question about by when are we expecting to see um, the, op the organizational structure changes at the country level, if there are any, from Mohammed Raihan? Um, that, that, that's a great question, and I, I try and be concise, but this, there's, there's a number of angles to it. The first is it's important to highlight there's two different types of changes here at the country level. One is the continue to engage in specific locations and geographies as part of the, um, the new operational structure. So it's a broad question where, for example, there's a number of dimensions in which ISNS, Institutional Strategy and Systems, will be working and continue to work through facilities managers at the local level. That work is local by definition. Those staff might be reporting into some heads of facilities management in a region or in a country who may ultimately report into a global facilities manager as a professional group serving local clients, but they will still be regional in the sense they're working in a region and serving a region. The second dimension is building specifically the regions and country global groups, excuse me, the regional groups as part of 
global engagement and innovation division. And that's a really important part because that's one of the foundations through which we aim to strengthen our connectivity through partnerships, fundraising, demand identification, regionally and in countries. Um, reporting into the, the global engagement and innovation division. An important part of that is the next phase of, we're just finishing the regional director appointments. There were a couple remaining. Uh, we'll be announcing that very soon. Um, and next part of that process is that we, the next phase of, as part of the next phase of senior appointments is, is, is appointing country, um, let's land on the country managers, country directors, country representatives, we need to find the right title um, for key countries in which we work. Um, to, and they'll be reporting into the regional directors, um, which, as I said, form a key part of the Global Engagement and Innovations Division. So we're still building the process around this. We expect those country managers to be knitting together our effort at the country level um, to help prepare country engagement frameworks over time, to look at even things with ISNS, to be a partner with ISNS on even things like how can we have better facilities management at the country level where maybe we can bring CGIR together more, maybe even save on rents in some places, Let, let's see. So that's an important part of this discussion. There is the GE&I building that regional support and country support capability. And there's the broader question of how the CGIR operates and engages regionally, where we all have lines into a region, whether it's research or providing a geographically based service. Um, so I hope I've answered that, Mohammed. I appreciate that was somewhat um, complicated. The next question I'm happy to say I can direct to Fiona, and there were a couple of other questions, Fiona, in the chat I wonder if you could touch on, um, and that was about how um, contracts, insurance plans, annual leave, et cetera, will be hand handled in 2022 onwards in, in one CGIR. Similarly, there was a question, and that was from Silvestro. There was a question from uh, Sunkura um, about, do you have a plan for, um, I think, it, uh, same position grade and salary range for all CGIR uh, staff? So over to you, um, Fiona. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hi, Silvestro, and, and thank you for your question. Um, I'm happy to clarify that we will continue to have employment contracts with the relevant centre. Um, as our employer of record. Uh, so you'll hear this phrase used quite a lot uh, in the coming months and years, an employer of record. Uh, for example, in my case, uh, I'm based in Rome and my employer record is the Alliance. So this means that in my case, uh, all my contractual terms, insurance plans, annual leave are governed by the Alliance as my employer of record. And this will be the same for everybody else. Um, all contractual terms will continue to be governed by the policies of our specific employers of record. Now, as the one CGI or common policies are developed and approved, they will gradually be adopted by all employers of record step by step. So at some point in the future, all CGI or staff will eventually be covered by the same policies. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of policies and this will take some time. Um, just before I finish, Sylvester, I think it, it's important for us to remember that policies that cover contracts and benefits are extremely sensitive and complex. Um, we recognize the importance, as I said earlier, of, of making the right changes the first time. So we will take our time and we'll work through a very detailed analysis in 2022 with the assistance of external experts before we start to make significant changes in this area. And uh, all staff can expect to receive regular updates uh, as we progress. Um, Thank you for your question, uh, Sunkura, on whether or not we have a plan for some position grade and salary range for all, um, all CGI or staff. Um, following on really from my answer to Silvestro, for the time being, and as long as we don't yet have in place uh, one CGI or policies and procedures and systems, all the current arrangements will continue as they are. Um, as previously shared, really our focus for the rest of 2021 um, is to complete the essential changes that help us to deliver on one CGIR, that get us ready for the start of 2022. This is what Elwin was calling earlier the, the early stage operating model. Now, 
those um, early that early stage operating model will not include changes related to compensation and benefits because I said as I said earlier it will take a long time to prepare and roll them out. Um, we can't share a definitive timeline of exactly what will change when, uh, because as we said earlier, it will be complex, um, but we will make sure that it is done in a very inclusive and transparent manner, and that uh, everybody will know well in advance of any implementation. Thank you. Back to you, Elwyn. Thank you, um, Fiona. And there was a question about, um, are there concrete plans to retain any staff with unique skills, expertise from CRPs, that are ending in 2021. That's from Eric Boy. Um, that's a that's a really important question. And you know what we what we what absolutely shouldn't happen is because we are in a we're in a bridging period between portfolios. That because of the uncertainty, as I should say, about because of this period of uncertainty, we do not we we deliberately or or or, or by accident do not retain key skills that we are highly likely to need in the new portfolio. Um, so we are uh, discussing that intensively with the leadership team um, and we are actually uh, getting into some quite detailed discussions which we will continue actually next week I hope to talk about whether there are ways in which we could and um, support what is currently center-based decision making um, about uh, contract renewals that are coming up so that we do not, there is not inadvertently and by accident, the loss of, of key staff. And, and there are various ways we can do that, which we'll be discussing with the leadership team. Um, uh, uh, Claudia, please, this, this is also very much part of your, your preoccupation. Was there anything you'd like to add on that one? Yeah, I think it's, it's worth noting that um, the, uh, uh, the expectation here is that the new portfolio uh, we'll be building on a lot of the strengths that we have developed to date. And while it will change and shift, uh, there, there is an expectation that it, the transition would be fairly uh, smooth in terms of, uh, of um, the scale of effort that we're making and, and uh, many of the topics that we're working on. So in a first best scenario, um, the specific technical skills that we have will move seamlessly into the new portfolio perhaps doing things differently, perhaps doing slightly different things, but a seamless move into the new set of initiatives. If as these initiatives are finalized and detailed and the teams are developed, we find that there are uh, sequencing or, or um, other, other concerns about disruptive or inadvertent uh, loss of key staff, we are looking into mechanisms to protect that. So really uh, exactly as Owen has said, with the first best option, being that we, we bring all those skills with us into the new portfolio very organically within the initiative. Thanks, Sean. Nadia, while, you're, um, while you have the mic, so to speak, there was a question uh, I thought was really interesting that came up about, um, it says, Elwin, you described the country changes with respect to only engagement in institutions. What, um, uh, what change do you foresee for research development and delivery? How do we manage country regional resource mobilization for diverse topics, who will be responsible? Uh, Claudia, did you want to uh, perhaps uh, say sure. something? Sure, I, I think that this is actually a really exciting new space for us. And this will, as we, as we really evolve the relationship between the country directors, the regional directors, and the global science group directors, we expect this to be um, a very live uh, engagement where the feedback that is coming from the country level and the regional director level is a constant engagement with uh, the ongoing portfolio management and the development of new opportunities and the relationship building that we have that will develop, uh, that will lead the research portfolio toward impact. So a lot of this will be in, in the coming uh, weeks and months as Elwin was describing the way the country level uh, uh, institutions will develop and the way that they will engage with the portfolio, both in terms of the regional integrated initiative, which, um, which obviously will have a regional focus themselves, but it'll be this feedback. It'll be the way we build the synapses between the country and regional uh, focus and the global and the uh, global science group directors and, and, and science groups um, that I think gives us tremendous potential uh, for, for uh, 
a much stronger impact. Um, a much stronger impact focus at country regional level and to, to hear our stakeholders that much more clearly in, in the way in which we develop and, and adaptively manage our portfolio moving forward. But Ellen, I see we're just about at time here. So any final words from you before we close? Elwyn, we've lost your picture and you appear muted. I'm not sure if you're battling your share of the uh, of the tech difficulties that I was having. There you are. I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so thank thank you, Claudia. I, I missed a bit of that, but but um, let me turn to another question from Shoba, um, which was: Will one CGIR operate in the current hierarchical structure or matrix structure as it is now a global organization? Um, another great question, and, and uh, the, I guess what I would say to that is that those, those terms hierarchical or matrix, I find actually very quickly so confusion and have become, can be quite political in some respects. They are value laden terms, even the notion of hierarchy. What we want for one CGIR is a structure where staff know who their manager is. Right? They have clarity. Um, staff benefit from clear decision making that, if needed, can go right up to the EMT or to the, 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 the board, uh, the system board, so that clear and decisive decisions are made, because it's often when those are not made that organizations can lose their way, compete with, within themselves, um, and, and not take high quality decisions. But for most cases, um, any decision-making structure has a highly delegated um, a process where the right decisions are made at the right level. So, um, you know, that is not about imposing a centralized decision-making structure unless and, 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 and as when you need some kind of central decision. There was a question earlier in the chat about standardization uh, in a number of ways. Again, it's a loaded term, but we do hope that over time we can build clearer common policies, approaches, um, terms and conditions, etc., in the way that men, most, or, most other organizations have successfully done. The notion of a matrix structure is again somewhat politicized sometimes because it, because it can often be taken to mean that we have a parallel decision-making structure um, operationally where at the one hand we have a center taking operational decisions and another we have the, those in the operational structure taking operational decisions. That is not the approach we, 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 we are moving towards. It will be the operational structure that takes operational decisions. That doesn't mean that many staff in that structure um, won't have many clients. And many clients is possibly a better term than matrix. They will be especially over time in the early years and even on some basis on a continuing way will be serving what we describe as the center structure. We'll be making sure payroll is done in that locality. We'll be making sure the early stage operating model keeps things running as, as they should. So really just to offer a bit of clarity on that, that we're not really talking about hierarchical or matrix per se. We're talking about decisive. We're talking about empowering staff, but we also are talking about being able to make decisions clearly um, for us all when, when, when we need to. Um, there was a question, please, Claudia, please. Sorry, we're, we're at time. Okay. So I think what we'll try to do is seek to answer the other questions, both in the Q&A um, and also in the evolving SAC that we, uh, that we build. Um, but with respect to everyone's time and knowing that many will need to drop off right now, um, we will put up another poll, uh, as we always do at the end, to ask you your preferences and what you'd like to focus on in future webinars and uh, communication so that we continue to focus on answering the questions that you have. But uh, while this comes up, I really just want to thank everyone so much for attending the webinar, um, for the excellent questions, both ahead of time and during the, uh, during the discussion today. I want to thank everyone for the updates that we've had. Um, Ali and Juan Lucas, of course, Elwin, and uh, some tremendous introductions to our new directors, Fiona, Carmen, Kulud, and uh, Marion and Absentia. 
Uh, following this discussion today, you'll receive a short survey to provide your feedback with updates on upcoming communications, etc. And just to remind everyone that a recording of this session will be made available on CGIR.org in the coming days. Uh, please feel free to share this with colleagues who were not able to attend. Um, so terrific to see the feedback that's coming up, which we will, we will capture and focus on going forward. Again, I hope everyone had uh, a bit of a break over the summer. Um, again, our thoughts and, uh, and concerns are with those uh, colleagues who are in difficult situations today, whether it's in Afghanistan or uh, concerns around COVID, these, these issues of staff welfare remain uh, top of mind for us. And the, the work ahead as we see these issues coming up on the screen are ones that we continue to engage in and can engage in in a much more targeted way with the feedback and the uh, candid discussions we appreciate in these all staff exchanges. So thank you, stay well, and we'll be speaking again soon. Thanks everyone, bye-bye. Thanks all, bye. -bye. Thanks,